Um, so anyway, yeah. Um, hi, I'm Christoph. Uh, I've been doing JavaScript professionally since JavaScript. Uh, and uh, I've even occasionally contributed to the language. Uh, for the next nine days, uh, I run uh, my own company, Delicious Insights, which is 12 years old. And um, we had been doing a lot of like professional training on uh, advanced uh, development related technologies and, uh, and then skills, uh, so mostly JavaScript, TypeScript, React, Node, Git, stuff like that. And uh, I'm about to switch. Uh, 10 days from now, I'll be starting a new position as a senior staff engineer at Doctorlib. Uh, so uh, you will probably hear a lot more from me uh, in that capacity. I, I sort of canceled most of my upcoming conference talks because uh, we need to figure out with Doctorlib how that would work when I'm speaking at conferences, except for one, Kung Fu Montreal. So I'll be in Montreal in February to give a couple talks. And uh, I'll be a Dr. Lieber uh, at that time. So anyway, yeah, <coughs> JavaScript and ECMAScript. Do we say JavaScript? Do we say ECMAScript? Are those even the same thing? So, OK, ECMA, ECMA is an international standards body. I hope this is uh, a refresher. For most people but many many actually don't so there's always new people in the field so i'm just spend a couple minutes on this acma is an international standards body just like iso or the w3c the ietf or the what working group and um it's based off geneva but it's actually international and it was the standards body that took care of the actual official standard for the language that we call javascript and so the actual official name of the language is ecmascript Hence the ES, when you see ES6 or ES2026. Uh, this is actually JavaScript. And for a while, those were two different things. JavaScript was the version of ECMAScript that ran uh, in Mozilla and Firefox. But nowadays, every browser sticks to the official definition of the language. We don't have the browser wars as we had them uh, in the late 20th century. And so, ECMAScript, JavaScript are basically the same thing, except that JavaScript is actually a trademark in the US that happens to be owned by Oracle Corporation. And uh, and the, the, there's actually a recurring call uh, for the community to actually rename the language to just JS, if only to avoid uh, recruiters and HR departments uh, that keep mistaking Java and JavaScript to this day. Um, and within ECMA, there's a technical comedy called TC39, and they are responsible for a number of standards. Uh, the language itself, like MyScript, that's standard 262, the INTL API for 402, JSON 404, and now the source maps. Uh, there's actually going to be finally an official standard for the source maps format. Um, and so those guys uh, meet every two months, basically, uh, on odd months, so January, March, May, July, and so forth. And uh, virtually, in room hybrid and for a couple of days uh, to uh, work synchronously together moving the language forward and everything else is async and online and public so there's actually a github repo github.com slash tc39 where you have all all the proposals all the upcoming proposals all the um um agendas for the meetings all the um, note taking for the meetings what are called the minutes so it's all open all public and you can actually participate in it and we are now on a yearly release cycle for the language. So the language actually has like one a yearly official release, usually in June. And uh, we sort of feature freeze everything that is fully ready, what we call stage four, in the language, either in January or in March. And then it percolates through the bureaucracy of ECMA. And you get the official PDF, the official standard, um, every year in June. But as you'll see, because of the stages uh, through which every new language proposal or library proposal has to go through, um, by the time it's official, you usually can already use it natively anywhere. And sometimes you've been able to use it natively for a couple of years by the time it's official. So stage zero is what we call a straw man. So it's really just someone raising their hand and saying, hey, that would be cool. Just literally anyone, you can, you, you can just like, create a new GitHub repo, put a markdown file, and say, describe in plain English stuff like, hey, that would be cool if we could do this and this in the language, either in the syntax or in the standard library. And that's a valid stage zero, OK? And to get to stage one, 
uh, you have to find what we call a champion on the TC39. So someone among the 40 some regular people that actually work full time on TC39, uh, someone who's willing to introduce your proposal at the next meeting and to champion it through the process. And so that person will introduce that stage zero. And if the committee decides that it's actually worth investigating, uh, it, it is promoted to stage one. It is listed in the official proposal. Let me just show you. Uh, ba -ba -ba. Everybody seeing that GitHub repo? Nope. Nope, you're not? Okay, so, so I'm, I'm like, okay, so I was, okay, I was sharing like uh, a tab. Let me just switch. Seeing it now? That's good. Uh, okay, cool. So the uh, that's github.com TC39 proposals. That's where I spend an inordinate amount of time. And uh, that lets you track everything that is upcoming at various stages. And stage ones actually have their own page because there's a lot of stage ones. Some of this have been uh, basically in coma uh, for the past six years or so. And they're very likely not to ever see the light of day. Um, but that's a stage one, okay? So you, you, you see there's a lot of stuff and then you, you're going to move to stage two and stage three. So you can see there's a lot of stuff going on. And then at some point you reach stage four, which means that you're done. You're actually done, you're, you're guaranteed to become official. So you can see everything that got released ever since yes, 2016, and then what year it got released. And so you, that's a good way for you to catch up on stuff that became official recently. My screen show my tab again okay so that's proposal stage two is uh, is a lot harder to, to go from stage one to stage two is a, like a massive step and uh it means that your entire spec text is done so you have to write the actual specification in terms of implementation in a specific format called spec text and it's all done you've covered all the critical aspects all the text semantics you've identified all the cross-cutting concerns so all the impacts of your proposal on the existing api and syntax and on the upcoming api and syntax that are in the pipes as well and you get to stage two usually by the time you get to stage two implementers start to notice okay so um javascript engine uh vendors uh babel typescript they usually start looking at stuff that is in stage two to provide polyfields or transpiling or to uh, integrate that in typescript stuff like that um, so stage two is where people start to really uh, pay attention. And stage three is pretty much as good as it gets in terms of specification. So when you get to stage three, and we've got a lot of stuff at stage three right now, we've got well over 20 proposals uh, at stage three, it means that the spec is entirely done. It's neatly tied up. It's been reviewed, it's been approved, the API is finalized, you don't have any, lef any leftover edge case. And so what is missing for you to get to stage four, which is the final stage. To get to stage four, you need two major st major things. First, you need to have full test coverage in the test 262 test suite. So there's this public suite of tests that is a conformant suite for any uh, creator of a JavaScript engine. So any JavaScript engine has to pass that suite 100% to uh, demonstrate that it actually runs JavaScript and it's done a library properly. And so, Whenever you do a proposal on the syntax or on the library, you have to provide the full test coverage for that proposal. Second, and that's actually harder, you have to have two native implementations in the wild. It means that to become official, you actually have to be natively supported by at least two JavaScript engines, okay? And uh, it could actually be like a, a more niche or exotic engine. We have some of these. Uh, but most of the time, one of these engines is going to be V8. So the engine that underpins Node and Dino and any Chromium-based browser, so Edge and Chrome and Brave and Samsung Internet and Opera. And the other one usually is SpiderMonkey for the JavaScript engine in Mozilla Firefox. Uh, sometimes it is actually uh, JavaScript Core, which is the JavaScript engine underpinning Bun and Safari. Um, but what that means is that be before you're actually official, you're basically available natively pretty much everywhere, okay? And uh, when you get to stage four, you are guaranteed to make it to the next feature free. So if you get to stage four in, in June, tough luck. You're going to, to have to wait for a whole year before you actually become official. But if, if you get to stage four, say in January, perhaps February, 
then you're, you're going to become official that same year in, in, in the June process. Okay. So um, let's let me start by like a quick refresher of stuff in the um, in the recent years that I believe uh, Adrien has raised his hand. Okay, Adrien. Yeah. Yeah. Just a quick question about the the whole. Uh, validation process. What makes a feature more likely to get from stage zero to stage four, to actually reach stage four, and maybe to do it quicker or quickly? Okay, so uh, there are a number of factors, really. Uh, if you look at history, so the, um, there are two uh, really big hurdles. Uh, I would say there's like a very uh, the two first steps are harder. Because getting from stage two to stage one means that you're convincing a TC39 member to present and to champion. Okay, so that's actually kind of hard. Uh, we've got a shit ton of stage zero presentations, and uh, maybe like 20, 25 percent actually are picked up for stage one. Uh, many of the stage zero proposals are actually sort of like uh, they're they're flimsy, you know, they're sort of like fanciful, uh, they, they don't reflect like a, a wide enough use case. Uh, they're like too niche or they have like good user land solutions or they're just, uh, there's too much fantasy, you know, in them. Um, but uh, so usually you, you have to have like a demonstrable uh, wide enough community need uh, for your feature to actually make it to stage one. Now to get to stage two, uh again you have to first you have to sort of like demonstrate like a level of commitment because ma many uh many people like it's very easy to to draft the docs uh for a stage zero proposal uh but to to actually ask for stage two promotion you have to uh, have put like a significant amount of work in the spec text in the cross-cutting concerns prior art research uh tentative syntax and grammar uh stuff like that so not many people actually uh, go all that way in the effort. Um, and also, it has to be something where uh, there is like a proven large need for it and that it needs to, there, there's a significant benefit to providing it uh, within the engine or within the standard library, okay? So it has to be, if it's something that you cannot provide a viable solution for in user land, so in libraries and transpilers, then it makes it a strong candidate, right? Like proxies, atomics, shared array buffers, stuff like that uh, cannot be done in user land. It has to be done by the engine. So that gives them a significant argument towards a significant like setting point towards actually uh, progressing. Uh, typing type systems, have like a very, very good, sustainable, high quality solution in user land, which is TypeScript, uh, which actually is a huge thorn out of uh, PC39 side because we have a finite set of resources and we can't just work on everything that deserves work, right? So when, when we actually have like a third party uh, providing like a very high quality, sustainable uh, solution for something, uh, we're very happy to let them work on it so that it can we it can free some resources on the TC39 side of things to, to work on other stuff. Um, so if you have like a, a very strong demonstrated need by the community, and if, especially if it's something where there are like significant benefit to it being part of the standard library or the standard syntax, and it has to be done by the engine, those are like major promoters. Okay, now, regardless of that, you have to have like committed champions that actually are doing the work. You know, like week in, week out, actually pushing that proposal forward, addressing the issues and the tickets on a GitHub repo for that proposal, creating the presentations for the TC39 bi-monthly meetings, doing the presentations, gathering feedback, moving the presentation forward, collaborating with um, competing or conflicting proposals uh, in the same space, uh, numerical separators, for instance, uh, got delayed like two years. Uh, by trying to figure out like a common ground with the uh, literal extensions proposals and that final extension ended up being ditched and so numerical separators got through. But um, yeah, you have the, you have to have like committed staff actually moving that stuff forward uh, on a regular basis for it not to die, really. Uh, does that answer your question? 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. thanks. Lily. Okay, thank you. Cool. Uh, all right. So, uh, quick refresher on stuff. Not stuff that you probably have heard about, because some of the uh, headline features in recent years have been shown like a, a spotlight. But some of the stuff that um, have not got so much spotlight, but I think are really cool in the past few years. Now, uh, full disclosure: I love regular expressions. Okay, and and uh, I'm actually sane of, of mind, uh, but um, you you can absolutely laugh love regular expressions and and be a good person uh but uh, a lot of the tiny new features coming in in the past few years and in the next few years actually are regex related so you'll find some slides about this uh, i won't dive too much into it but really uh there are like really good resources to finally grok regular expressions and there's like a before and after in your developer life uh when you actually uh finally grok regular expressions so there you go. Uh, it's actually a, a little thing that I like um, called match all. It's three years old already. And before that, uh, we had to choose, um, we had to make like a difficult choice uh, in our code between getting all the matches of a given regular expression in a text and getting um, individual subparts of those matches, what are called groups, capturing groups. Uh, but before 2020, whether we used match or uh, on strings or exec on regular expressions with a global flag like this, like this global flag. Um, we could not have both. We could not have both all the matches and the groups within the matches. Uh, match all finally lets us have both. So actually, it actually returns an iterator. So we have to, an iterable. So we have to turn it into an array if we want to use map or stuff like that. But uh, uh, it lets us grab all the matches and within those matches still get the groups. So it's kind of neat that we, we finally can do both. Um, we have had new promise combinators. So there are combinators that you've known for a while called uh, promise.race and promise.all. Uh, they've been there since 2015. Um, but they only covered two of the four use cases. Okay. Promise.all used to short secret on the first rejection. Promise.race used to short secret on the first settlement. And we needed two more combinators to actually cover all the angles. We needed to a combinator that would short secret on the first fulfillment uh, in scenarios where you want to uh, try multiple ways to get the same result uh, in parallel and you just want the, the fastest way to win. Uh, so it's sort of like the reverse of promise.all. So it's called promise any. And, um, and then you've got uh, promise.all settled and it doesn't short secret. So it will actually wait for every single promise to complete either by your rejection or by your fulfillment, and it will give you a full um, uh, result array status. So uh, we have those two combinators that lets us cover all the angles now. Uh, this one, this one is really cool. Uh, at so we finally have at on strings and arrays. Ah, oh, there you go. Yes, at is great. Uh, at uh, is because we have had we sort of have had negative indices in um in javascript but not all the way through uh we we could use ne so negative indices are something you find in python and in Perl and in ruby and all the good languages uh and they're basically from the end okay it's like you have length before that so minus one is actually length minus one so it's the final element okay it's the ultimate element minus two is the penultimate element and so forth and so on and it's actually kind of nice to say something like cities uh minus one instead of cities square bracket cities dot length minus one and stuff like that. So, uh, but we couldn't do that. Uh, we could use negative indices on strings and on arrays with um, APIs like slice and splice and stuff like that, but not with the square brackets, okay? And that's because square brackets in JavaScript are not specific to arrays. Square brackets are a generic operator called indirect indexing. And it, it, it works on every single object and it has a single semantics, okay? so. It, it takes an expression, that expression names a property, and if that property exists under that name, it will return it, otherwise it will return only fine. And we can't change that semantics just for arrays, okay? So you couldn't do my array square brackets minus one, okay? Which is something you would have liked to do, but it would run counter to the regular semantics of the square brackets uh, operators. So we have an at method on arrays and strings, uh, which can use an at takes any form of index, a so positive index, negative index, and, and returns it to you. 
So finally getting the last item is just at minus one, which is reasonably short. Um, and um, and you can actually say at zero or at 12, that works as well. But it, it provides us like with a reasonably concise way of using negative indices to get a specific cell on a string or on an array, okay? Uh, so it's, it's kind of cool. I kind of like that we finally have that. Uh, in the same spirit, yes, Stefan. Yes, yeah, sorry. I have a, a question related to at. If we have like eight elements and we specified at twelve, is it yes. like looping, like in Ruby? No, 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 no. It's just like just like any position uh, in any API on um, on arrays or strings or intervals. Uh, it, it's not going to loop, right? Uh, yeah. It will it will find that there's nothing at that position and return and define. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Uh, yeah, and uh, uh, another tiny thing uh, on the strings, it's not based on iterability. Um, actually, oh, let me double check that. I, it might be based on iterability on strings. So it, it's not like uh, the square bracket or the uh, all the legacy API. Let me just check. Da, 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 da. Uh, I believe, is it based on iterability? Uh, uh, because in the string sister ability is based on full code points uh, where regular positions are actually based on uh, code units. Uh, ba -ba 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 -ba. Yeah, it's code unit space. Okay, so it's, it's like the square brackets. So it will not work in terms of string iterability, which is full um, Unicode code point based. Uh, it's based on code unit just like all the slice and splice and uh, square brackets API on strings. So it has the same way of counting positions. Uh, find from last is something we've had this year. Uh, we used to have uh, find and find index that actually worked from the beginning of the strings. And we, we used to have APIs that also worked from the end of the string. You know, like uh, we had reduce and reduce right. We had index off and last index off, but we did not have um, reverse versions of find and find index. So when we wanted to find the last item that matched a given predicate, uh, we had to do some reverse or to do it ourselves. So we finally have find last and find last index that work just like find and find index, but from the end of the array, which is kind of cool. And uh, to finish with a great stop, uh, we've had like a really, really cool uh, proposal coming in uh, this uh, this year. Uh, it actually went from stage zero to stage four within a single year, which is actually really cool because it was actually very easy to implement. So that's another factor that I did not mention uh, when answering Adrian's question. But one of the ways you can actually move forward very fast if it's the implementation is trivial. <laughs> uh, so um, um, about half of the API on arrays is mutative. So it actually changes the arrays in, in place. Uh, including stuff like reverse and sort, okay, but also splice and um, and um, push, pop, shift, and shift actually modify the array. And, and the other half is actually um, immutable, okay. So we've got stuff like a concat, which actually does not modify the array, um, and uh, map and filter and uh, every reduce sum, uh, reduce right, all of those fine are immutable. And um, some of those APIs, we needed like a non, an immutable version of, okay? So uh, you might want to reverse an array towards a new array and not change the original array. Or you might want a sorted version of an array that does not touch the original array. And you would have to like copy the array and sort it. Uh, same for splice. You might want to, yes, uh, Thomas, exactly. Those are part of the slow and steady takeover of functional programming on JavaScript, which I'm actually very happy about. <laughs> but uh, because functional programming rules, and um, and the um, splice splice is also like a, a Swiss Army knife uh, API that can do like a shit ton of manipulations. You can do like removal, replacement, insertion of content with splice, but it changes the, the array. So you might want to do that in an immutable version. And my favorite is with. Okay, if you've ever written like a, a manual vanilla JavaScript sort of immutability, like cheap immutability, and you, you had to write an immutable function that actually uh, created a variation of an array where just one cell was modified. 
you know that it's kind of ugly to do it manually. You have to do like a slice dot concat dot slice, uh, which is not really nice. Uh, and we now have width. Uh, width takes a position, which obviously can be negative, and takes a value, and it will return a variation of the original array where just that position was changed. So width is actually really nice. And we're actually working right now with the uh, React documentation team for some of their pages on state management, especially managing state that contains objects or arrays, so that especially arrays, so that the examples in there uh, can exist in two variations, like older JavaScript and 2023 JavaScript, so that they can actually leverage those uh, methods. So it's kind of cool. And now let's talk about stuff that is coming. OK? Some of that is actually already available natively. but um, So <clears throat> array from a sync. It's at stage three. Um, we actually, uh, I think the TC39 November meeting just happened. So some of those things might have reached stage four uh, in the past couple of days. I haven't checked. Um, array from a sync is like a simple helper uh, to take an asynchronous iterable, so like a readable stream, for instance, or an event, an event um, emitter, uh, event stream, stuff like that, and to just aggregate all of its contents in an array. So it, it's a promise. You just wait, and it, it just waits for the async iterable to be done, to be complete, and returns an array of all the values. So it's actually kind of neat. Uh, it's a sweet little helper. It's very likely to be official for next year. And it's all already available in Node, for instance. Uh, those are really cool, like really, really cool. Uh, collection and iterator utilities. So we got like two things in there. First, we have new methods on set, right? The set constructor that we've had since 2015. Uh, we have new methods in there to do all the regular set operations, okay? So set into section, union, difference, disjunction, superset, subset, all of that. Uh, we have new methods on set to do it for us, which is actually kind of neat. Uh, but on the same way, we have like a proposal at stage three called iterator helpers, and there's an async version of that too, that provides all the usual operators you find when working on collections, especially in a lazy way. Uh, so stuff like take and drop and filter and map and reduce and and um, all those uh, intermediary steps, stuff that we do a lot in functional programming or if you've done RxJS, those are very close to Rx operators and transforms. And um, they're becoming part of the uh, native library. So every single native iterable or async iterable will provide those methods. And so you can use that same thing like, OK, uh, Fibonacci would be like a, a, genera a generator, so uh, uh, an asynchronous iterator, actually. And you could uh, you could just like not actually synchronous. And you can say, OK, take 10. And that gives you a new synchronous iterable that just is lazily evaluated. So it still hasn't computed. It will just stop uh, after uh, you consume 10 of it. Um, so and values and many other other things like that. So it's going to make it's going to basically drop Lodash. OK, we have like a, a lot of stuff coming in the standard library that just eats away at reasons for us to use stuff like Ramda and Lodash and data fans and just helps us keep our bundles smaller and smaller. OK, because a lot of that it's like the INTL API. The INTL API is amazing. It's been there for ages. And a lot of people still use like a, an enormous like moment.js or whatever uh, to actually uh, format their dates or, or get like reference lists of units or currencies or languages or countries. And all of that is actually natively available in, in like 200 languages uh, in the INTL API. And, it, and it's kept up to date. OK, because it, it binds to the uh, uh, OS level ICU library. So um, a lot of people still don't use the INTL or don't realize they use INTL. And same thing for uh, these. These are going to eat away at Lodash. And so you can replace them uh, uh, slowly and slow and steady uh, and, uh, and just have like a, a lot more tools in your toolbox right out of the native standard library. Uh, array grouping, same thing. Uh, it's at stage two, but uh, I, I would be very surprised if it's not official um, for the next year, because uh, it's fairly easy. We finally have an arrays group and group to map. Okay, so group takes like a, a, a transform function, a mapper that produces a group key, and that returns an object by default. That means that our keys have to be valid object properties, so they have to be strings or numbers or symbols. 
And if your keys are more complex than that, you can use group to map so that it will actually produce a map object and maps can have keys of absolutely any type. So that, that's again, another cool thing where we don't need to use Lodash anymore, okay? This is actually quite likely to be official even if it was just introduced uh, this spring and it feels complicated, but it's actually already available in V8. It's actually, it's been in Node ever since Node 18.16 and we are at node 21 okay uh, so it's uh and and so it's in all the browsers except firefox but i believe firefox actually spider monkey actually implemented it. it's part of typescript 52 babel has the transpilation so i would be very surprised if it's not official in 2024 it's called guaranteed resource cleanup and there's actually like a, a general name for that in um, software engineering called RAII, Resource Acquisition is Initialization. And that's something that you already have in C Sharp with using, in Python with with. When you do Java, it's the try with resources um, approach. Um, you have that in Swift also, I think. Uh, and so the idea is that uh, at the beginning of a scope, any scope, including a block, and not just a function, could be like a regular block, um, you can declare and initialize resources using the using keyword and possibly await using if you have like an async disposal. And um, this initializes and allocates resources uh, in a specific order and it absolutely guarantees that these resources are going to be disposed in the reverse order at the end of the scope. So when the lifetime of the object ends and the object is garbage collected, all the underlying resources uh, will be properly cleaned up. And uh, so, a lot of these standard library uh, objects like event emitters and streams and sockets and all that natively implement this. And your own object can implement that as well. Your own object can implement specific symbols called symbol dispose and symbol async dispose that let them interoperate with that syntax and be automatically disposable and cleaned up. Um, so that's a major deal, a really, really big deal. Um, I actually was reading like a really cool in-depth article about this uh, earlier this morning. And um, it's a really big deal. Uh, it's something that people have been wanting for a lot of time because it reduces enormous amount of boilerplate with like nested try finalies and um, uh, scope juggling of the uh, of the um, references that have to be declared using let instead of const and stuff like that. Um, and uh, that's really, really great. Uh, we are, uh, I'm actually missing a const uh, in that demonstration, but. Uh, that's really great. And um, it's very, very likely to be official next year. Uh, you can already play with it and, or just use transpilation in Babel. Um, and it simplifies code that deals with uh, third party resources, both synchronous and asynchronous in a, in a major way. Import export attributes are very likely to be there in the um, ES 2024. They're not as big a deal. The idea is that uh, we used to have something called uh, import assertions and uh, they've been superseded by this. And the, uh, the idea is that when you do an import statically or, or dynamically, you can provide like a with syntax and provide metadata for it. And uh, some of those metadata are reserved, such as the type metadata that just asks the engine to check that the actual content type of what you're importing matches your expectations to avoid uh, cross-site like script injection or stuff like that. Uh, but you can also provide like custom uh, in-house metadata, both in your exports and in your imports. And so you can have those metadata floating along the actual content of your imports uh, and, and use that. So it's a, it's kind of a neat feature. It's going to be used by many frameworks. In your own application code, I don't expect you to use that as much, but it makes it easy for frameworks. Regular expressions, I warned you. Um, so uh, this is actually kind of cool. Uh, we, ever since ES 2015, we've had Unicode support for regular expressions with the U flag, which changed the dynamics of some of the um, uh, escape sequences. And uh, in ES 2018, we've also had what are called property escapes, which is like those backslash P curly braces something, which is like a big, big deal. But something we could not express until very recently is express a class. So in regular expression, the class is just the entire set of possible code points for one character in the text, okay? So when you do like a backslash D, 
uh, you're saying digit, ASCII digit, that's a class. Okay, when you do like square brackets, A, B, C, D, E, square brackets, that's a class with five possible characters for that position in the text. And what we could not do is construct classes based on other classes. We couldn't say, okay, so that the intersection of this and that class, or the difference between this and that class. Uh, we cannot do that. So when we want that, we now have like within a class, within those square brackets here, and I'm just like that here, within those square brackets, which is a class, we cannot use other classes in there and use either a double dash, which is a difference. So everything in that class except this, okay? Or a double end, which is an intersection. So everything in that class that also belongs to that class, okay? And we, we, and we can do that multiple times. And uh, when we need those syntaxes, instead of using the U flag, we use the V flag. And that that is extremely powerful. You could say, like I said here, all the Khmer letters or all the decimal digits except the ASCII ones. So there are, there are actually a lot more decimal digits than ASCII ones. Uh, so you, that, that lets you express in a very concise way what could be like a, a gargantuan set of code points. Okay, if you if you ask Babel to transpile that to ES5, you're going to end up with a regular expression that is like just a series of code points that feels like two entire screens. Okay, even if you have like a one of those mad badass like huge curved screens. Okay, so it's a uh, it's going to um, to really make your code a lot more readable for those needs. Something we might have in ES2024 is promise with resolvers. So please do not abuse this. It's really more designed for library and framework authors than application code. And it's when you um, when you need to create a promise wrapper and and just pass control of the uh, settlement of that promise. So whether it succeeds or fails to a lot of other pieces of your code. And you don't want to write this entire set of your code within the promise callback, okay? So to avoid doing that, there's this promise with resolvers that actually returns both the promise and the resolve and the reject function that you used to have access to only within the uh, constructor callback. And that lets you more easily orchestrate your code uh, in a way uh, where you pass those in several callbacks in, in existing code instead of putting all that in the, the promise constructor. Uh, there are good use cases for this, but what you should never ever do is return to your calling code, not just the promise, but those methods as well. Remember that a promise is supposed to be read-only for consumers. Okay, So it's really you as the creator of that promise and the person returning that promise that should have access to resolve and reject, but not the outside world. Decorators. OK. So feels like what we call in France, the serpent de mer or a marronnier. Uh, that thing that we keep talking about for the past 10 years. Um, and TypeScript has had decorators forever. Uh, decorators have had like a very long and complicated and circuitous uh, standards history. They were almost there six years ago. And then someone realized there was like a really bad edge case that had not been addressed and they got demoted back to stage one and re-architected from the ground up, uh, which was actually uh, a blessing in disguise because the, the new decorators are actually a lot simpler and a lot easier semantically than the old ones. Uh, TypeScript decorators used to be based on the old decorator semantics, which is now um, deprecated, and they are now uh, aligned with the new um, decorator semantics. So sometimes you use um, frameworks where it's all decorator base, right? If you do like Ember or you do Angular or you do Nest, uh, you have decorators all over the place. Decorators are IOP, right? They're aspect-oriented programming. Uh, they've been around forever. We have the decorators of their equivalents in, in Python, in Swift, in Java, in Rust, uh, in, uh, in PHP even. Uh, so um, it, it's neat. You should not abuse them. But they're they're here. That you, you've actually been able to use them uh, through Babel for years and years and years, and through TypeScript. Uh, they might finally reach stage four and finally be there natively um, in 2024. Uh, I am not aware of blocking uh, points uh, right now, 
uh, we will know soon enough, right? If they reach stage four, I'll just check that I haven't reached stage four this month, because that would be fun. Uh, the creators, the creators, no, they're still at stage three. Unfortunately, the last time they were actually presented and progress was made was last March. So, and do we have an agenda for the next meeting? Let me just check quickly. I know, I know you're not seeing this. I'm not switching. Let, let me just, just share this. So let me just check the agenda. Okay, so the agenda for the so that was 11. We do not yet have an agenda for the January 2024 meeting. Future meetings, maybe. So, oh, there's actually, oh, okay. So the November, the November one is actually happening next week. Uh, okay. And, the, and then we're going to switch to even months instead of odd months. Okay. So that's going to be a change. So, okay. So maybe I'm not seeing the... Uh, do we have the agenda for November then? Da, 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 da. Okay. Like I told you, it's all in the open. Okay, so time box discussion. Do we have anything about decorators coming up? Uh huh. Nope. Okay, so it's not going to be November. Oh, there's just a normative update. Okay, cool. So, you know, we would have to have. Um, Oh, okay, so that actually killed my share. Let me just uh, share my slides again. Uh, you would have to have like a specific point in the uh, in the uh, February meeting about promoting them to stage four for them to be official. Again, though, uh, they are um, they are usable already either through TypeScript or through Babel and. Uh, the semantics and the syntax and the API have been stabilized forever, so you could absolutely use them in production, as we do with Nest or Angular or Ember. Um, it's just that they're not strictly official yet, and I'm not entirely sure they're going to make it for 2024, hence the question mark in my title, but uh, going there. Shadow Realms. So Shadow Realms have actually been demoted to stage two, but I, I believe I've seen a point in the agenda for this month to promote them back to stage three now. Shadow Realms are not something you're going to use in most of your projects, but it's going to be used the heck out of by uh, any online IDE or sandbox, because Shadow Realms actually provide us with a clean, well-defined primitive to sandbox JavaScript execution. So take JavaScript anywhere, control the entire environment and set of global that it has access to, and execute it in a sandbox way in a separate thread. So that's a godsend for like web-based ID, stuff like God, you know, like code sandbox, uh, GitHub, uh, code spaces, uh, VS Code.dev, all of those. Uh, DOM virtualization as well can use that very, very well. Test frameworks can use that. So it's going to be like a big deal. Um, but um, it's it's just not going to be application side code, but very much for a lot of like tooling and frameworks. And stuff that might come in beyond. So, so stuff that I've been that has been forever in the works, and I can't wait for it to become official, is Temporal. Temporal is going to just kill every single library you have working with times, uh, like time computation, OK? When it comes to formatting, we have INTL already. When it comes to computing stuff that is related to dates and times and calendars and moments and intervals and durations, uh, we have to deal with stuff like data fans and so many other libraries. Um, they are not perfect. They don't do everything. Uh, and Temporal is going to replace all that. And Temporal is absolutely amazing. Just two quick examples. Uh, so we have those two meetings, right? And you see, we have dates without times. So just like the 1st of January, 2020, the 1st of April, 2020, we have times without dates. Uh, and then we can create a time zone. Out of the uh, out of it, and then you can say, okay, give me for uh, Montreal, give me the absolute time for that meeting at that date with that time, and it's going to be 3 p.m. UTC because in January Montreal is on winter time, and if I ask for April, well, Montreal is in summertime at that point, so it's going to be 2 p.m. UTC. But let just check that example. That example just blows me away. So. Here's uh, what I call a zone date time. Okay, so I say, okay, so we're on 8th of March, 2020 at 11.55 local time, Hong Kong. Okay, 
And that's where my flight leaves. And my flight lands on the same day at 9.50 a.m. in Los Angeles. What is the duration of the flight? Okay. And it's going to give me what I call a 9.08601 duration. It's going to say, okay, that's 12 hours and 55 minutes. And it handles all the shenanigans of time zone and DSTs and all that. And I could go the other way around. I know that my flight has a 14 hours and 10 minute duration. Okay, so I actually create a duration. And I can add that to that same departure time. So I say, okay, so I'm leaving at 11.55 local time in Hong Kong on the 8th of March. And my flight is 14 hours and 10 minutes. What is going to be my landing time in Paris? And it will tell me, okay, same day, but 19.05 in Paris. Okay, so it's, it is so nice. They have an API for everything. They distinguish times and moments and durations and intervals. You have the notion of like just a day and a month. Okay, for example, for birthdays. So you, you can say, okay, the 4th of November, and that's it. And then you can say, okay, in that year, that year, what's the day of the week and stuff like that. Uh, you even have, you can express stuff like uh, uh, recurring events, you know, like uh, Halloween, like uh, Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving is the fourth Thursday of November, or Father's Day in French is the third Sunday of June. You know, stuff like that, and you can express that and have that properly translated, specific calendars and specific times everywhere. Temporal covers every known case to men, okay? And, uh, and with a very clean and consistent API, it's all immutable. It's just so great. Uh, you have like really good docs, really good cookbooks. You can play with polyfills uh, someplace, and I can't wait for it to become official. And uh, it's going to just trim our bundles so well, and we pro probably remove some bugs that we still haven't fixed uh, in our code using data fence and stuff like that. Uh, collection normalization. You have a new option coming in in Map. Uh, called Coerce Key and Coerce Value that lets you automatically transform keys and transform values as the map is being populated. For instance, you could normalize like HTTP headers to lowercase, stuff like that. And M place is sort of an absurd operation. You can say, okay, so I want to add that key. I, I want to work with that key on the map, but behave differently whether that depending on whether that key actually exists or not. If it doesn't exist, you should run that inside first. And, and then once it exists, or if it exists already, you can, you can run that update. So it's sort of like in Ruby, when you do a hash new and you provide an initialization function for missing keys, sort, sort of the same thing. So we're very sorry about M place. Uh, Upsert had issues apparently in terms of naming, and we had to go with M place, which is like fairly ugly as a name, but uh, we're going to have that iterator range is a small helper that immediately lets you create ranges, numeric ranges, possibly with custom steps, inclusive or exclusive, upper bound. So it's a, a very tiny helper. You find in a lot of libraries. It's finally going to be native. And let's wrap up around functional programming again. We're going to have native immutable types for records and tuples, okay? So we're going to have immutable objects, deeply immutable objects, we call them records. Deeply immutable arrays, we call them tuples. Uh, the only way to create those is as primitive types using literals. So you will just have like a hash sign before the curlies or before the square brackets. Uh, those are deeply immutable and th they are automatically deduplicated in memory, what are called interns. So if you actually create, end up creating algorithmically uh, two tuples that are identical or two uh, records that are identical, they're actually going to be the same object in memory. So the idea is that you can, you can just like triple equal and just check the reference. And if they're semantically equal, they're going to be the same object in memory. Obviously, that speeds up enormously stuff like dumb diffing or any complex algorithm like that. Um, and we have like very uh, many of the traditional APIs we use to introspect objects or arrays still work. We have built in APIs to go from mutable to immutable. Uh, and we even have like a JSON pass immutable uh, that is just a JSON pass with a custom reviver. Uh, there's a great tutorial. There's a great playground. I'm going to give you the URL to the slides in a second. Uh, there's a great cookbook. You can play with these. Uh, those are going to be amazing. They're going to be really, really cool. Uh, same object pick and object omit of stuff you have in Lodash already. The idea is to be able to just create an object from another object by just selecting a low list or a deny list of properties. Uh, so we're going to have them in the, uh, the standard library like this. 
uh, but we, we might, and I just want this so bad, we might have syntax to do the same thing. Because otherwise, you have to always like do a destructuring and do a new literal that is exactly like the destructuring. And that's very ugly and not dry. And I really want those syntax to come in. But I think it's still at stage one. Uh, functional programming again, the pipeline operator. So that's something we, we come from that comes from hacks and uh, F sharp and many other languages. So it, it's a very clean way to be able to describe multiple processing steps, possibly lazy. So evaluate it just as a, a like an RxJS string, basically, just evaluate it as you go, depending on your needs. And you can describe all those steps and you can use the placeholder. So that, that person syntax for the placeholder is actually very much in question. Uh, but uh, it's going to make it so much more readable to describe like processing pipelines uh, in our algorithms uh, instead of like wrapping functions inside each other. It's going to, to be really wonderful. And we have pattern matching as well in the works in terms of functional programming. We even have some stuff coming from Ruby that would let us write readable regular expressions so that we can indent them, uh, use comments and white space. And uh, so we have some stuff in the works for this. Okay, Ooh, just two minutes late. Uh, if uh, I'm still available, if some of you have further questions, uh, let me just like stop that sharing. Actually, we started with a bit more than 10 minutes. Uh, okay, but uh, minutes late, so actually, we're pretty good. Uh, and I think we've <laughs> still have some time for we're questions. on time. So if any of you has like questions about either stuff we've covered or stuff that you heard about that that wasn't covered in the slides, just shoot. Well, first of all, thank you so much. Uh, it gives the That's right welcome. idea of what's coming up and, and and new things to play with. Um, Who learned about stuff? Who learned about stuff today? Yeah, for sure. Um, <laughs> the other one's a bit silent, but I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, I got <laughs> some fun sure. raising. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I had a, a first question, maybe very naive, uh, but still. Because JavaScript is evolving, it's, it must be behind it. TypeScript yeah. obviously is here to kind of stay now and yeah. um, strong. But do you see them merging at some point? Because we've seen uh, proposals uh -huh. from the TypeScript team to JS. Yeah. So I know it's a, it's yeah, kind of a yeah. common and, and, so, and easy question, but yeah, it's, it's, it's kind of incest incestuous. Uh, so. <laughs> Uh, there's no, there, there are absolutely no plans to merge, but there are a few things. Uh, the uh, TypeScript is not just syntax, right? It's an entire set of tooling. It's the language server. It's the compiler. It's uh, it's all of that. So it's a, uh, and it's a, and it's a different release cycle, right? There are a lot of like features, type related features that can move forward a lot faster and outside of the engine. Um, so it's really two different release cycles. So the um, First of all, TypeScript and JavaScript are going along very well. Okay, uh, on the TC39, the five Microsoft representatives are all from the TypeScript team, and and we we the TC39 is is so happy that TypeScript exists and is that solid and high quality and sustainable because again, uh, there is a significant need for uh, strong typing in JavaScript. Uh, which is why TypeScript currently enjoys almost like a 66% dominant market share. Um, and the uh, and that's an entire set of work uh, that the TC39 doesn't have to do, right? Because the, the whole TypeScript community does it. And it, it truly doesn't need to be in the engine because it's, it can absolutely be done in user land. So it's, it's really great. And also TypeScript by design at any given point is a strict superset of JavaScript. Okay, so any JavaScript that is valid is going to be syntactically valid TypeScript at any given time. TypeScript will never ever diverge from JavaScript and semantics. Even if it means deprecating stuff to realign like they did with decorators or stuff like that, or modules or, or stuff like that. Now, the um, the only thing that, uh, what, what what is nice about having TypeScript team input in TC39 is that this is Microsoft. They have probably the the, the most diverse set of customers uh, in the developers using um, Microsoft tooling. And so they have the most diverse set of use cases and JavaScript being used in the wild. And so they come up with 
like very informed um, set of like selling points and arguments about why uh, this or that feature of the language should be designed this or that way. Uh, sometimes they've done a lot of that thinking and architecture work ahead of time within TypeScript or, or just by virtue of the customers. And so they're bringing a lot of reflection already baked uh, to the TC39 table. And they're helping inform and refine the TC39 process uh, a lot faster than it would otherwise be. The uh, now there, I I believe the proposal you're alluding to is adding uh, native support for type annotations uh, in the syntax. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, so be very worried about this. So the idea behind that proposal is not that JavaScript actually interprets and type checks. Okay, the idea is that JavaScript would allow that syntax as a no op. Okay, uh, so that we wouldn't have to transpile. Okay, so that we could take those TS files and load them in the browsers or node, and not have the type checking, but at least they wouldn't hurt, right? And so we wouldn't have to like do that transpiling to actually run it. That's the whole idea. Let's just make that like a, a inert syntax, syntax that doesn't hurt the the engine. The engine just ignores it. Okay, unless it's syntactically invalid. But uh, as long as it's syntactically valid, the engine just ignores it. And so it, it spares you from having to use like ESBuild or TSC or whatever to strip the type annotations so that it would run on your engine. So it's just about alleviating the, uh, the tooling chain um, towards the runtime. So that there's significant support in TC39 for moving that proposal forward. I don't know whether it's going to, it, it is non-trivial to say the least. Uh, in terms of um, parsing, because it requires uh, abandoning some uh, parser optimization shortcuts, uh, finding new ones, um, stuff like, for instance, um, TypeScript requires that uh, files using JSX are named TSX so that it can disable some short, short circuitry in its parser when it encounters an opting angular bracket, you know, instead of automatically saying this is a generic type parameter, it has to do some significant peek ahead to figure out whether it's JSX or a type parameter. And, um, and that's costly, which is why it asks us to name those files TSX so that it knows it needs to do that and it doesn't have to do that in TS files. Um, that would become uh, an issue again on the JavaScript side of things if type annotations and generics and everything became part of the language. Uh, and that might end up being confusing as well to people saying, okay, so JavaScript has those, but it actually doesn't use that syntax. It doesn't do the type checking. It just lets that through and ignores it. So I have no idea whether this is going to be adopted. There's no like, um, there's no knee-jerk reaction against it at TC39, but um, there's like some significant debate about the pros and cons of JavaScript actually just allowing that syntax without doing anything with it. Um, I, uh, I really, uh, TC39 has no zero intention of actually doing the type checking themselves and, and doing the strong typing themselves, uh, for sure. It's, uh, it's very likely going to be enshrined in TypeScript. I think there, there's really just TypeScript at that point, doing that and doing that well. And TC39 sort of supports that effort, but, uh, uh, it, it won't be within engines. Engines won't do type checking, for sure. Uh, it's not their job. That's not what they're doing really well. Uh, and it, it's going to be TypeScript or some variation of the TSC. There's this one guy, completely madman, uh, rewriting the entire TypeScript type checker in C++ uh, and boasting over a thousand times higher performance uh, currently. Uh, so that, that, that would be interesting because <laughs> the type checking is what is slow about TypeScript. Right? It's not about uh, uh, transpiling, it's really type checking that is slow. Uh, so that's uh, any like further optimization is good, but it's not going to be TC39. It won't do it. Uh, they're not going to merge, that's for sure. Um, it's always going to be TypeScript on one hand and TC39 on the other hand. They might in the end decide to let the type annotations through without touching them. Just like, you know, we've had in ES 2019, I think we've allowed uh, Hashbang hashbang prologues at the beginning of files to, to be there and to stay untouched, you know? And Node would let them through and browser engines would let them through so that we, we could actually use uh, those scripts both as 
CLI tools and regular scripts that you could load. Uh, so that's another example of like inert syntax uh, that we allow in, in JavaScript. But um, if we do support TypeScript in like a, a more intricate way, that's going to be the extent of it. Oh, thank you. OK, interesting to see where it's going. Uh, a bit confusing for people and have a lot of things about, OK, why would I start a plain JavaScript project today? And, and is it going in the same direction? This kind of yeah, I don't, I, I don't think there's a reason, really. Uh, I think TypeScript, so first, people have to remember that TypeScript is just about, yeah, it's type annotations, but you don't write TypeScript. When you write TypeScript, you write JavaScript, first and foremost, right? It is JavaScript. That's what's going to be run. And that's the 95% of the code you're going to be writing is actually going to stay past transpiling. And that, that's your actual feature code. And that's JavaScript. And um, learning JavaScript is learning TypeScript, to be sure. You know, like, it's like a, an enormous amount of it. Uh, and then there's the whole type checking thing. And uh, I do believe that there's at least like one universal benefit to TypeScript, regardless of context and projects and team which is that it, it significantly boosts the developer experience in, in that it informs the tooling so much better. And you get like actual reliable compression and auto imports and fine references and refactors and all that. So for that alone, um, I am not surprised that the TypeScript architecture keeps rising meteorically. And uh, I fully expect uh, this year's state of JavaScript survey next month to show that the people doing a majority of TypeScript and exclusively TypeScript are going to be even higher than they were last year, like significantly higher. Uh, I, I would not be surprised to say that, to see that like 80% of people are doing mostly TypeScript and like maybe a third of people are doing exclusively TypeScript, right, this year. Uh, and that makes sense, I think, like especially in a Greenfield project, that totally makes sense. People should actually use TypeScript, but for the past 20 years, we've had people writing type JavaScript day in, day out, and never actually bothering to learn it. To this day, most people still don't understand this in JavaScript, still don't understand counts that is not immutable, still don't understand a number of things. Uh, and TypeScript is the same thing, really. Most people do TypeScript without actually having learned it. And, and that's how you find a lot of like TS ignore and no strict mode and any's all over the place, right? And um, and they're not using TypeScript properly. So just like JavaScript, the benefits of TypeScript are only unlocked when you actually invest in actually learning it for real, right? And as a company, uh, as a team and as a company. And uh, TypeScript does not uh, mean, oh, you have all the safeguards like Java or anything, and you don't have to really learn it uh, anymore. And uh, types are going to be the savior. No, no, you're actually going to, uh, feel that types are more of a hurdle than a benefit if you don't actually learn TypeScript really. OK, I think that's a good statement to end up this talk <laughs> on. That sounds uh, good. Thank that's you. good to stop as any. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Thank you so much, Christoph. Uh, for You're most talk. welcome. Um, Thanks for attending. Yeah, very useful, very insightful. And the replay will be as well for anyone who couldn't join today and, and many of them. Uh, so thank you. Thank you so much again. Uh, very happy and excited to have you today. Thank you, everyone who joined as well. Uh, have a great day in France, end of day in Japan, uh, from Stefan and Thomas, especially. And um, yeah, see you, everyone. Bye. Thank you, Christoph. See you some other time. Bye.